Saturday morning, cold. You have a million things that you could be doing. And I want to express my gratitude um, for your presence this morning. And I recognize very deeply that as Josh mentioned, uh, this room is full of stories. And those stories are stories of pain and grief. And they're stories that do not have an ending per se, at least not yet. I'm aware of that. And so I'm keenly aware this morning that you and I are very much the same in that what we would like to have is a life that works, a life that is dependable, a life that is ordered, that you can depend on what's going to happen, when it's going to happen, and almost, if you will, kind of mathematical equations that if you will do X, then you can count on getting Y. Or conversely, if you don't do X, then you don't have to worry about Y happening. Um, and there's a lot of support from the Bible that would tend to say that that's the way life works. From the Proverbs, if you will live right, then you're going to eat well. Or if you will work hard, diligently, then you're going to get ahead. That's the kind of life we wish we had. That you just do certain things and you know other things are going to turn out all right. But undoubtedly what, ha what haunts us is the question, what if? And for us in this room, I suspect it's not what if, it is what now? Because the equation has broken down. Uh, whereas we thought if we would just do certain things, we would never have to worry about other things. Then all of a sudden it doesn't seem to work that way. We share the same story. Now, my story, because of the chair, is a little bit more obvious, perhaps, than others. Uh, you may be able to walk around and nobody be aware of the story or the pain or the grief uh, that you're dealing with. So we share the same story. Mine's just a little bit more obvious. So let me go ahead and tell my story, which really... I think is our story. Um, after leaving Oklahoma in 2005, in the winter of 2006, I began to have some pain in my left foot. Now, it wasn't very bad pain. It was just kind of a nagging pain. And it happened especially after I was exercising. That is the irony of this entire thing. And the moral of my story is don't exercise. Because <laughs> if you exercise, look at what happens to you. Well, my foot started hurting and I'd been exercising. So I thought, okay, well, if you stop and rest for a few weeks, you're going to be okay. So I stopped, rested for a few weeks and then started exercising again and the pain was still there. So being a man, I thought the, the solution to this problem is therefore one must exercise even more vigorously. And so that's what I did. And the pain was still there and kept getting worse. So several weeks later after denying and not wanting to do this, I felt stupid sitting in a doctor's examination room with the complaint of simply a sore foot. And then I felt really stupid 
When the doctor came in with the x-ray, put the x-ray up on the machine, never a good sign, and pointed to a very fine line in the middle of my foot and said, you've had a stress fracture. And by looking at what I see here on the screen, you've probably been walking on it for three months, huh? Yeah, I have to say, yeah, I did that one. But again, the equation, right? Uh, you put on that walking boot for six to eight weeks, everything ought to be okay. So I put it on, wore the walking boot, six to eight weeks, still wasn't okay. Another six to eight weeks, still wasn't okay. It took six months for it finally to heal. The problem, though, was that even though the fracture was healed, the pain continued. And so several weeks later, after thinking, well, I don't want to go through this again. Surely I haven't done it again. I finally went back to the doctor thinking, well, I've cracked it again. But this time the x-rays were clear. And the MRI was clear. And the CAT scan was clear. The bone density tests were clear. It wasn't until we started doing the nerve conduction studies that some things began to pop out. There was apparently some impingement, something kind of blocking or on top of the nerve, the main tibial nerve that kind of goes down the back of your leg, into your foot, into your ankle. Something was kind of pressing on it, kind of like carpal tunnel. Many of you have heard of that. This was tarsal tunnel. And so it was, it was impinged. Now, the best thing to do when you've got something like that is to do nothing. To just go ahead and keep going and hopefully that it's going to work itself out so that you don't have to do any surgery. And if you have to do surgery, put it off for as long as you can. And so we did. My first surgery was in July of 2007. Went in, tried to open it up. It was definitely blocked. And that helped for a little while. But then the pain would return and get worse. So almost a year later, in 2008, after I had finished teaching that entire school year, the day after I submitted my final grades. I went back into surgery to try to open it up again and see what was going wrong. And again, it was blocked. There was a lot of scar tissue, so maybe this was going to be okay. But after that surgery only gave a minimum amount of relief and the pain came back and kept getting worse, it was clear that we were beginning to deal with something else, not just nerve impingement. And so doctors start throwing around words or, or you know, abbreviations like RSD or CRPS or CMT or something else that's, that's like one of those. To take one of those just as an example, CRPS, um, I don't even remember the initials now, but CRPS is, is a syndrome that occurs when you've had a minor injury like a stress fracture, but it sets off a firestorm in the nervous system so that the nervous system overreacts. And even when the initial injury is healed, the nervous system doesn't realize that. And it keeps sending signals more and more and more and worse and worse and growing. In 2008, uh, October 2008, I went back to see my doctor checking on this. And the doctor came in and took one look at my foot. I remember this vividly turned around immediately and went out and called a neurosurgeon. 
because apparently the nerves were so overreacting at this point that they were cutting off the circulation to my foot, threatening my foot itself. Ten days later, I had surgery number three. The circulation improved. I had to cut some nerves in order to get that to happen, but the circulation improved, but again, the pain was still there. So the fourth surgery, and thankfully we don't have pictures of this one, the fourth surgery was to implant a neurostimulator. I wouldn't be surprised if several of you have a neurostimulator implanted yourself, where they put it into your spine, and then they run it over to, wires over to your hip where they put a transmitter, it helped a little bit. The best thing about it, though, was whenever any of my colleagues in the College of Bible locked themselves out of their house and needed to get in through their garage door, all they needed to do was call me. I would come over and bump their garage door with my neurostimulator. It'd go right up. The last surgery, the fifth surgery, the last attempt to do something was in November of 2009 where they opened it up, kind of a last ditch effort. The nerve was just in disarray. They cut a little bit more of it. And during this time, I also went through a divorce. And just when you think it can't get any worse, you folks know this, here it comes. In the summer of 2010, the very same symptoms began in the right foot. Now the game plan for CRPS or any of these syndromes ultimately is pain management. I spent four weeks uh, a couple of years ago at Baylor University Medical Center in a program that was just for pain management. And by the way, if that's what you need, that's a great program to go through. Did a lot of physical therapy, still do. Aqua therapy in water. Meditation, which is really great if you stay for the second session. I'll meditate for you and show you how I can levitate off the ground about three feet in my chair. But also a lot of drugs. A lot of drugs. On the ACU campus, they simply call me Dr. House. <laughs> but I can take house any day of the week, so I'm Dr. Pemberton. Now, I tell my story not because I want sympathy. I do not want sympathy. You understand that. I don't want sympathy. I tell my story because it's our story. I mean, it's our story that what we want in life is a life that works, a life that's ordered and reliable, and it turns out the way we wanted it to turn out. And what we get is not what we want. Sooner or later, it's going to turn. And then what do we do? When we kind of go face first, smashing into the realities of life, and it's ugly. It's as ugly as a foot that's been cut on. And uglier. It may be a marriage, maybe a child, or maybe an occupation or cancer. You name it because you know it. And for many of us, not all, thank God, not all, but for many of us, if we are honest with ourselves, we know it's not going to get any better. And somehow we're going to have to learn to live with this because we can't go back. And I want to be very careful about what I say here because I don't know the churches 
where you have come from. And I don't know the Memorial Road Church, grateful for them hosting this seminar. But it's an unfortunate reality in many churches that for those who are in deep pain, there's no place really to go for help. And in fact, in most cases, I'm afraid that most churches kind of ignore the pain that is all over the auditorium on a Sunday morning by just singing one more praise song after one more praise song. So that, oh, I'd like to take a poll, but I shouldn't. At least for me, there were times when the hardest thing to do was to go to church. Make sense? See, a lot of, I mean, it, the hardest thing to do because I knew when I get there, I was just not going to fit in. Now, I've got some good news about that today. Really good news. And that is, it doesn't have to be that way. It shouldn't be that way. And with God, I think, has provided a different way for people of God and for churches to work so that there is a welcoming and helping spirit towards those who are in great pain. And that's lament. Now, some of you have already got the book. Uh, you've read a little bit about it or you've studied lament before and you already know about what lament is. But I want to take some time in this first session to just talk about, okay, what is this thing that we are calling lament? So number one, what's lament? Lament is the language that explodes out of this collision between what I've always believed about God and the world and what life is supposed to be and my experience of life. When those two things come crashing together, that's where lament comes out of. Does that make sense? I mean, we, we always thought life would turn out this way. We always thought we wouldn't have to worry about that. And then all of a sudden it comes down on us and it's, ah, oh, what are we to do? That's where lament comes out. When I can't be silent, I need words to express what's going on in my life, words to speak to God. And it's, I can't just ignore this. This is my life. And from my faith, I need a language by which with reverence to address God and speak of the deep pain. And much like Moses in many places when he argued with God, to be able to argue with God about this and speak the deepest truth of my being to God. That's lament. Second, let's turn to Psalm 13. And, and let's work with Psalm 13 in the background of our minds. Psalm 13 is a lament. And um, it's a lament. I'll explain why it is a particularly good lament for what we're doing today. I guess I should look at the watch. What time are we supposed to stop? 11.45? Okay. Okay, good. Well, I may not. <laughs> okay, what is lament? Psalm 13 is lament. How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I bear pain in my soul and have sorrow in my heart all day long? How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? Consider and answer me, O Lord my God. Give light to my eyes 
or I'll sleep the sleep of death. And my enemy will say, I prevailed. My foes will rejoice because I'm shaken. But I trusted in your steadfast love. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. Lament. Make some observations based on Psalm 13. That lament is first and foremost addressed to God. Uh, do you see that in Psalm 13? It is immediately addressed to God by saying, How long, O Lord? And you see other places where the psalm is addressed to God? If you see them, we're in a small enough room. Just shout them out. Where do you see it, if anywhere? Verse 3, Verse three yeah. O oh Lord, my God. Do we see any others? Verse 1, Verse one O Lord. Okay, that's really important. Because... Some people think that lament is just complaining, moaning and groaning and whining. It is not just complaining. Lament is addressed to God. It is speech to God. It's not just a catharsis where we just get all of that junk out of our system because we're speaking to God. And I think that's terrifically important because we understand in lament that addressing God is the most important thing we can do. That ultimately, I've got to talk to God about this because God is the one that matters. And if anything can be changed, God is the one that's going to change it. So in lament, lament is addressed to God. Okay, second observation. Lament is composed of basic elements. You might even call them building blocks of lament. For example, we've already talked about the address, but there's also complaint that's addressed to God and that complaint goes in three directions, typically. First of all, the lament, uh, the complaint, will talk about what's going on with me, how I'm hurting or grieving, whatever it may be. And then the complaint will usually talk about others. Now, the others may be making things worse. The others may be what caused this in the first place, the enemies. And so I think what you could do with a lament, given this others category, is that could be anybody or anything that stands opposed to you. So the complaint talking about others, the other, could be the other death. The other pain, the other cancer. And then the lament will complain often about God. Because if we are going to worship and honor a God for being in control of the universe and blessing our lives, then when everything falls apart, I think we have to talk to God about that because ultimately God must be held accountable. Now, we'll talk more about that. You can ask me about that, but the complaint will be about God. Notice in verse 13, how long, Lord, how long? You're going to forget me forever? That's complaint about God. 
And, and then in verse two, the complaint is about what's going on within me, the pain in my soul. And at the end of verse two, it's about my enemy. So all three elements are there. So there's the complaint. Second or third, there are the requests. And the requests are going to follow the complaint. In other words, I'm going to ask God to do something for me. I'm gonna ask God to do something about them. And I'm going to ask God to do something about God, whatever that may be. Uh, what are we up to? Number four, then I'm going to try to motivate God to do what God needs to do. Little divine arm twisting. You see it in, verse, in Psalm 13. Uh, you see it in several places. Give light, this is in verse 3, give light to my eyes or I'm going to die. Now that may be literal, I'm going to die. Or that could be metaphorical, like when your kids said, if I don't get something now, I'm just going to die. Well, they're not really going to die, but it's going to be bad. You can't want that, God. Or in verse 4, my enemy's going to say that they prevailed. How can you want that, God? You can't possibly want Texas to beat OU in the Cotton Bowl. That would just be wrong. Look at verse 5. I trusted in you. What an incredible motivating clause. I've trusted in you. You can't let me down. So in the laments, there will be, in a variety of ways, these um, motivations. Trying to get God to do this. And then finally, the last element is praise or a statement of confidence. And it's really a ra rather remarkable thing. We'll talk about it here in just a moment that you're going to conclude with praise or confidence. Okay, third observation about this lament psalm is that lament is a language that's on the move. Now, we, we've already just mention these elements but I want you to notice especially that lament even though it says a lot of hard things to and about God that most laments in fact all of them except for maybe one or two in the book of Psalms will conclude with a word of praise or confidence and in Psalm 13 it's a rather jolting. Uh, Psalm 13 has been saying, how long, how long, how long, how long? And then at the end, beginning in the middle of verse 5, my heart will rejoice in your salvation. I'll sing to the Lord. I mean, that's a remarkable jolt. It'll almost give you whiplash. You're talking about all of these things that are wrong in what God needs to do and how God has failed. And suddenly he says, I'm going to praise the Lord. How do you explain that? Well, scholars have gone all over the place with this one. Let me give you two or three ideas that might explain it. One is it may be that this last phrase in Psalm 13 is written later and added to the psalm. Well, that's a possibility. Or maybe there is an oracle of salvation that has been pronounced but not kept in the psalm. Okay, you say, what are you talking about on this one? Back up to Psalm 12. Psalm 12 is also a lament. And as Psalm 12 is in the midst of its lament, Verses three and four, may the Lord cut off all flattering lips, the tongue that break, makes great boast, 
Those who say with our tongues we will prevail, our lips are our own, who is our master? Notice verse 5. Because the poor are despoiled, because the, because the needy groan, I will now rise up, says the Lord. I will place them in the safety for which they long. So now we can sing praise. Because the Lord has spoken or intervened, and now we can have confidence and praise that the Lord is going to do what we've been asking him to do. It's an oracle of salvation. But if that is the case, then most of those oracles of salvation have not been kept with the psalm. But maybe we're supposed to imagine that in verse 5, between those two lines, there was some oracle of salvation pronounced. Maybe. Or maybe it's simply the faith of the psalmist making a move back towards confidence and praise. Not rushing the process, but reassuring both himself or herself as well as God that I've said some hard things, but what you need to know is I still trust in you. I will still praise you no matter what. And however hard it is to say those words. Okay, what's lament? We're, we're saying lament's on the move. It's moving toward praise and confidence and a reestablishment of the norm, if you will, forth on this. What's lament? Lament's a language that dares to speak the truth. At least the truth as I see it. What's in my heart? Now again, you see this in Psalm 13. Where the, where the psalmist speaks the truth about the situation as the psalmist understands it, that the Lord seems to have forgotten him, that the Lord seems to have turned his face away from him. Now that's really important because back in the book of Numbers, there was this great blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you. You remember that text? So when you say, how long will you hide your face from me? That's big. And how long is this pain going to be in my heart? Okay, Psalm 54. Go to Psalm 54 with me. I'm sorry, Psalm 44. Psalm 44. If we're going to talk about speaking the truth, let's take a look at this one just for grins. Psalm 44. I want to pick up in verse 9. And uh, let's all fasten our seatbelts for this one. Here's what the psalmist has to say to God. Yet you, God, have rejected us and abased us and have not gone out with our armies. You made us turn back from the foe and our enemies have gotten spoil. You have made us like sheep for slaughter and have scattered us among the nations. You have sold your people for a trifle, demanding no high price for them. You have made us the taunt of our neighbors, the derision and scorn of those around us. You have made us a byword among the nations, a laughing stock among the people. Drop down to verse 17. All this has come upon us, yet we have not forgotten you or been false to your covenant. Our heart has not turned back nor have our steps departed from our, your ways, yet you have broken us in the haunt of jackals and covered us with deep darkness. An overwhelming accusation of what God has done and yet we have remained faithful to God. Psalms of lament Tell the truth. 
They speak the truth, no matter what that truth may be. Okay. One more observation about the Psalms of Lament. The Psalms of Lament, therefore, I think, are intended to be the way in which we stay connected to God when life is falling apart. In other words, this language is not just here for us to look at and say, oh, well, isn't that interesting? This language is here for a purpose. And I think the very purpose of this language is so that when life is falling apart and when I can't pray those other prayers with everybody, there is a language that we can use provided by the Lord himself that we can stay somehow, some way in relationship with God. Okay. <clears throat> Um, we're going to have time for questions and comments here uh, toward the end. But I want to go somewhere with this now. And this is in the book, but we're going to do it here anyway. If this, is the, if this is the case, that the Psalms of Lament are intended or given to us so that we are able to stay in relationship with God even when we're mad at God, angry with God, then we've got a problem because when was the last time you can remember anyone in your church in an assembly pray anything like Psalm 44? <laughs> yeah, I think the laughter is appropriate. Can you imagine that? I can imagine a person who did that would be the last time they were asked to pray on a Sunday morning. It would be quite a commotion. And I think that's a problem. Okay, we did some studies. Let me get this off, off here. Get over here to the side so I can join you in looking at this. We did some studies uh, when we were working on the book about how much of this lament language is in the Psalms uh, versus other kind of language. So this book of Psalms it actually is divided into five books. I expect you are already aware of that. And so we kind of did this study book by book. So the first book of Psalms, there you go, has 41 Psalms in it. It's Psalm 1 through 41. And by my analysis, there are three praise Psalms in those first 41 Psalms. 12 Psalms of thanksgiving or confidence, 19 lament Psalms, and seven others. Now by the others, I mean these are the psalms that might be like for us the, um, the psalms or songs like, um, oh, you got to go home now because now the day is over, the assembly's over, get out of here kind of psalms. Um, okay, now that's kind of surprising, isn't it? That if you really analyze the book of Psalms, that the first 41 psalms, there's only three praise psalms. The biggest category are the laments, 19 of them. Let's go to the second book. Second book, 31 Psalms, and the same analysis. Three praise psalms, four thanksgiving, 19 lament. Let's go to the third book. Again, only four praise psalms, only 17 psalms in the third book. But nine of those are laments. Isn't that amazing? Let's total that up. For the first three books of Psalms, you have 10 praise psalms out of 88, 89 psalms, 17 psalms of thanks or confidence, but 47 laments. 
47 laments in the first 88 or 89 books or chapters of the Psalms. This, this first kind of dawned on me, this overwhelming presence of the Psalms in the first few books of the Psalms when I was in Denver working on my doctoral work and on the side, I was working for the World Bible Translation Society, doing some translation work, editing kind of work, and I was working on the Psalms. And my editor called me one day and said, how's it going? I said, it's going great. The Psalm editing is going great, but I'm depressed. <laughs> and I said, he said, you know why? I said, no, I don't know why. He said, because you're working on the Psalms. Well, you don't think about that when you think about the book of Psalms. But the book of Psalms, the first three books, overwhelming lament, overwhelming. Okay, let's take that off and look at book four. Again, only 17 Psalms and you see a change all of a sudden. We could talk about that another day. But now we have 11 praise Psalms and only two laments. And in book five, 20 praise psalms, 11 laments. Now, it's clear in book four and five, you've really got to swing towards praise, right? But if we add all of these up for all five books, it's still, lament is the dominant form of psalm. So if you want to take off, talk about the book of Psalms, you're really talking about the book of laments. And that's surprising. But I think that's also telling that percentage-wise, in the book of Psalms, 40% are laments. Only 28% are praise psalms. And the book of Psalms was by all accounts the hymnal of the early church. And in the hymnal of the early church, they had a lot of lament. Okay, let's keep the book of Psalms up there with the, the numbers and the percentages. The second thing we did was start to, or we analyzed several hymnals. And we did uh, the songs of faith and praise, that gigantic hymnal that has 885 so uh, songs and then all those readings and stuff, you know, the really big blue one for Churches of Christ. We also, uh, if you come from outside the Churches of Christ, we also did a hymnal from, from the Baptist tradition and Presbyterian tradition. Um, and the numbers turn out the same. We're singing the same songs. So, in the songs of faith and praise, how many praise songs? Overwhelming, 264, 30% praise songs in our hymnal. How about psalms of thanks and confidence? A big percentage, 44% thanks and confidence songs. We like to sing songs of gratitude and confidence, and that's good. How about lament? 111, 13%. Now I've got an asterisk beside that because I want to come back to that number. Other Psalms, and these are like the closing hymns kind of thing, 118 of those, 13%. So you notice compared to the book of Psalms, that the praise psalms are just about the same, 28%, 30%, just about the same. But what's overwhelmingly swapped is that the psalms of thanks and confidence have become 44%, whereas the laments in the book of Psalms are the 40%. They've almost kind of drawn an X. Can you see that? Does that make sense? The, the laments, only 13%, kind of like the, the Psalms of th Thanksgiving and confidence in the book of Psalms. Now, let's talk about that 13% for a minute. Because if you really compare what the Psalms are lamenting about 
compared to what our songs are lamenting about, it's really only 3%. Only 3% of our hymnal is really like the laments in the book of Psalms. That's staggering to me. That's overwhelming to me that something has changed. And I'm not going to blame anybody here. I'm not going to blame the, the songwriters or the song leaders or any. I mean, it's a circular thing. It's something that's grown over the years. It's pervasive. But something has happened to us in regards to the language of lament. Now, you may say, well, that's good because we need to get rid of that language of lament. Maybe we'll talk about that after lunch just a little bit because I don't think we need to get rid of it. I think we need it desperately. We hurt just like those in the ancient world with the same kinds of pains and the same kinds of questions. Yes, we may have some reason for greater faith, but that has not taken us away from having to live a life that is far from perfect. Okay, get a drink and then I'll make three more observations here. Three more observations about this. First of all, uh, we didn't do a lot on this, but if you're wondering about contemporary Christian music, Contemporary Christian music really has the same basic percentages. Um, in other words, while there are some really good laments among contemporary Christian music, by far, contemporary Christian music is still doing the praise thing far more than the lament. So, yes, there's something happening there, but it's still the same basic percentages. So that's observation number one. Second observation or thing that I need to communicate here is that I'm not suggesting that we should replace praise teams with lament teams. <laughs> that, you know, what we ought to do in church is just sit around and lament all the time. That's not what I'm saying at all, at all. Now, this hurts me to say this or to quote it because I'm a preacher at heart. And I think what preachers do is really important. But I'm afraid, not afraid, it's just the case, that what we sing forms us more than what we hear from the preacher. Because we're singing it. We're involved with it. And so the preacher can say whatever he wants to. It's going to be the songs that form who we are spiritually. And if that's the case, we're in trouble. I'll have to turn around to read this one. Denise Hopkins, uh, she has another name. I missed it. She says, if we are what we sing, then we are in trouble in terms of expressing the reality of the life of faith. Because what we're singing all the time are praise song after praise song after praise song. And that is forming us spiritually so that when our life comes meeting face to face with trouble and difficulty and pain, we're left without resources. Because all we've been doing is singing the praise songs. I hope that makes sense. So the third observation, and this will really surprise you, we need the language of lament. We need to learn it so that for ourselves, when life hits those moments, we have a way and a language to speak, to hold on to God with all our strength and be able to be honest with God. I think you get that. I, this is a room that has stories. We need that language that I can hold on to God and yet not have to be 
faking it. I can tell the truth and it's okay. We need to la learn that language for ourselves, but I'd also argue we need to learn that language for other people so that when those who are around us can't pray, they can't speak, that we have the right words to be able to pray on their behalf with lament. Uh, this one more thing I want to show you and then we'll do a few. You know, we've got some time for comments and questions. When I was teaching at OC, um, I was teaching a, a course on the Psalms and I needed a midterm exam and so I'd written the midterm exam and I got to the end of it and I was counting up how many points I had on the exam and I was one point short, you know, of needing, I had 99 points for the exam. I needed one more point. <laughs> so I couldn't think of another question. So I bailed out and asked the question, what's the most significant thing you've learned about the book of Psalms up to this point in this course? <laughs> you can't get that question wrong. If you tried, I mean, if you write something down, you're going to get it right. If you, if you learn that, you know, there's 150 chapters in the book of Psalms, well, who am I to say that that's not the most significant thing you've learned? You can't get it wrong. So I was reading through these papers. And as I was reading through these papers, we came to this statement. Since my mother died my freshman year, and even more so after my father's death this year, it has often been a struggle for me to maintain a healthy prayer life. Can you imagine that? I did not question God or the relationship I have with him, but I wasn't honest. After the first week in this class, I began praying Psalm 13 and finding that if I was honest with God, sometimes angry with him, then I could truly talk and pray to God more earnestly. This class has taught me how to hurt with God rather than hurt without him. What an amazing thing. And as a teacher, I think you ought to just resign after that because it's not going to get any better. We need lament. And I suspect because you're here this morning, you already knew that. But I wanted to talk a little bit in a different way about what lament is and what lament does and why it's so important that we find a way of restoring the language that the early church used and that people of faith for centuries have used in order to stay honest with God and in a relationship with God when our worlds are falling apart. We've got, oh, seven or eight minutes here to take some comments. Comments are good. Um, observations are good. Stories are good. Keep them short. Or questions. And Josh has got a microphone or two here. So if you have something you'd like to add or question, if you just raise a hand up, Josh will come running to you. Got one way over in the corner, Josh. I've always... Um well, I've changed my attitude. I've always been afraid to question God when something wrong happens because who am I yeah. to question him? Yeah. And then when I read stories like people that served him in the Bible, Gideon, Jonah, um, even some of Job's friends, even Job, yeah. you know, and I say they have the audacity to talk to their creator like that. Yep. You know, I'm feeling like, you know, he's going to do something to you, <laughs> yeah. you know, and that scares me. Yeah, stay back because here it comes, right. Yeah, and so, uh, you know, I just say, Lord, just help me understand, you know, 
and just guide me because I don't, you know, you know everything. His thoughts are higher than mine. And yeah. so I just ask for courage and strength. Well, that's good. I think that's good. Um, I think we're going to work on that the second session a lot more. Because what we need to do the second session is we need to think about, okay, yes, all of this talk about lament is fine and good, but <laughs> uh, can I really do that? But is that really something we should do in the assembly? You understand? So I want to I want to defer to the second half for the kickoff uh, to talk about some of what you're expressing because I, I hear you. Um, is that what God really wants? And I think the answer is yes. That's the kind of relationship that God really wants. As opposed to a relationship that just, oh, everything's always fine, no matter what. Thanks, that's a great question. 